Today we're going to take a closer look at the mechanics of games by examining one you may be familiar with, Backgammon. Andrew Grant has worked in game companies such as Looking Glass Technologies and DreamWorks Interactive. Now he teaches at MIT. Even though he makes computer games, Andrew will show us how to identify, define, and analyze the mechanics of a traditional board game. Hi. My name is Andrew Grant. I'm the technical director for the Game Lab and lecture a fair bit too. Today we're going to talk about an older game, Backgammon. Uh, you've probably played some old games. Monopoly, for example, at this point is over 100 years old. Backgammon is just a little bit older than that. Uh, Backgammon, as you would recognize it today, you'd probably be able to play it in about th the 3rd century. But it goes back even farther than that. It was invented about 5,000 years ago, where its ancestors were. This is, for reference, about the same time that we invented writing. And so, and not coincidentally, in about the same place, actually, near Persia. So after 5,000 years, you can count on the mechanics of backgammon being really tight. Nothing is wasted. Also, you have to consider that it was made at a time when no one could read the instructions. The rules have to be very, very simple. Um, important safety tip, they won't read your instructions today either. Um, but anyway, um, it all comes back to the same basic ideas. You've got your dice, you've got your checkers, and you've got the board layout. And everything folds back into those three mechanics over and over again. There's no story, there's no complications. It's really pretty simple. Now there's a bunch of other games that have the same kind of pedigree that Backgammon has. They've been around for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, chess, Checkers, Go, Mancala. Uh, Nine Men's Morris are ones that, that will leap up if you do a search on it, but there's a whole, whole bunch of them. Um, we're talking about backgammon today because it has the dice mechanic, and that randomness is a very useful tool for your prototyping. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rules. I'm going to do it very quickly here because, well, you know, there are plenty of places to learn the backgammon rules, but you need to know some basics before we go on. So we have an initial position on the board. Um, the goal of the game is to get all of your pieces off the board before the opponent gets their pieces off the board. Uh, you go in a U shape around the board. So you're trying to get your pieces to your side of the board over here and then off. The board always starts with the same layout. And the weird thing about it is that you've got this U shape right here where um, you sort of turn the corner. So a piece moves from here over to here. Now you can only move in one direction. You can only go home. You can't go backwards. Um, and then on your turn the way it works is you roll your dice and you get to move twice, once for each die. You can move in any order and you can move any token you want. Well, any of your tokens. You can't move the other person's tokens. If you are trying to land on, on an opponent's piece, you can only do that if it's alone, if it's by itself on the, on the space. If it's got another piece with it, it's protected, and you can't even land there. So it's quite possible that when you roll your dice, you won't be able to move at all if the only legal moves you have are blocked by your opponent. If you are so lucky as to roll the same number twice on your dice, say two fours, then you actually get to use each of those dice twice. So instead of going four twice, you get to go four four times. If you roll double twos, the same thing applies. You get to roll, move four times, but with a two every time. If you capture an opponent, remember when they're alone, they're vulnerable. Then they go onto the bar in the middle, and they have to come back on the board before the player can make any other moves at all. And the way that works is the player takes their turn as normal. This is actually kind of important. It's a really cool, cool trick they use. It doesn't matter what happens in your turn. It always starts the same way. When you bounce the dice, roll them. Then you can put that, when you're captured, you can put that point, put this checker back on the point <laughs> as if you were starting from the, the, as far as possible from your home. So if I roll a two, I would go one, Two. I have to put it into a space that the enemy does not occupy. And I have to do that first before I move any, but anything else. And then finally, there are a couple of rules about when you're actually, when can you move your pieces off the board. You can only move your pieces off the board after all of your pieces are in your home section of the board. So everything, everything has to be there, and then you can start moving pieces off. You can only move pieces off in a particular order, I'm not going to get to those details. Um, it's not a really complicated, but it's not actually important what we're talking about today. So those are the basic, basic rules, but I want to talk about why we care and, and, and what these rules mean. 
but we're going to start with dice. One of the nice things about dice is they're a really, really easy way to get a random number created. And random in this sense is just sort of, I want to pick a number, but if the players were left to do it themselves, they would pick a number they liked. In this case, we want to make them pick a number that they might not like. So you start with a simple six-sided die. If you think about what, it happen what happens with it is you roll it and you get an equal chance of getting any of the numbers on the die. If you roll two dice and add them together, it changes a little bit. So one die can make any number between one and six, equal probability for all the results. Two dice gives you a number from two to 12 if you add them together, and the probabilities are no longer the same. Twos and twelves are actually very, very rare, and seven happens pretty often. And so that's a really, really useful trick. One of the things you can do with dice is, the more dice you add to your pile, the more you can expect that the extremes of what you're gonna roll are gonna be rarer. And the middle is gonna be a little bit more common. And we, you can use that again and again. Now, we can also use some math, and I mean very simple math, to figure out some things about your game. So, with two dice, in general, on average, if you look at the long term, you're gonna get about seven pips every time you roll. Well, given that you know how many pieces you have on the backgammon board, and you know how far they have to go to get home, you divide, you add all that up, divide that number by seven, and that's roughly the number of turns that each player is gonna get. There's a couple of little weirdnesses in there. When you roll doubles, the player's gonna move a little bit farther, and when they get captured, they're gonna be set back, but pretty close. If you just count, add them up, divide by seven, you're gonna get pretty close to the, amount, to the length of the backgammon game. And that's a good trick that you can use for your own games. If you decide how long is this game going to be, and you can, you can add it up, figure it out, probably how long it's gonna be. Now, you can use other dice too. Backgammon uses six-sided dice because, well, they're based on squares, and that's really straightforward. Um, today we've got all sorts of crazy shapes and sizes of dice. Um, you can also kind of cheat a little bit if you want to. You could put a post-it on the side of a die and change what the numbers are if you wanted to. You can add them, subtract them, multiply them. I've even seen games where people divide the dice to get even different distributions of, of what random numbers you're gonna make. Um, you can also roll the dice and use that to look up the results on a table. Rather than just adding it up and getting a number, you can say, oh, well, a seven means that something net bad happens, but a six means that something really good happens, and just have it on a table. And this is kind of a cheap and easy way to create a deck of cards without having to actually make the cards. Now, if you want to know what's going to happen with your dice, if you want to know, you know, just how common is it to roll a three on these two dice, one of the things you can do pretty easily, especially for just two dice, is make a little table. I would start with, you know, maybe a big die and a small die, and you put the big die down the side and the small die across the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and just go ahead and stick in each of these cells of the table what the result's gonna be. Now, adding them up, you probably don't need to go through that exercise. But if you're doing something complicated, like the big die gets multiplied by three and the small die gets subtracted, well, you probably wanna fill in that table. It'll only take you a minute or two, and you'll know what actually your die mechanic is gonna give you. You can count the number of results in the cells to find out which ones are good, which ones are bad, and how your game's gonna work. 